Alvin Lussier was a visionary composer and sound artist whose works explore themes of perception as well as acoustic phenomena. Perhaps his most famous and influential work is the 1979 composition, I Am Sitting in a Room. I am sitting in a room different from the one you are in now. This elegantly simple work explores themes of decay and the phenomena of a room's unique acoustical properties. In doing so, it opens up a plethora of questions about our own perceptions and the nature of music, questions which have inspired generations of composers and listeners since. Back when Lucier made the first recordings of this work, he used the most high-tech equipment available to him at the time, that being two tape machines. In today's day and age, we have a much more affordable and widely available way to recreate this piece, and that's with software. To start with, let's explore how this piece functions. You begin to record into the first machine while reciting a text that explains the piece and what will happen. When done speaking, you stop the recording and immediately play it back. Simultaneously, you start recording on a second machine. When the playback is done on machine one, you switch it back to recording and you play back the recording on machine two at the same time. You repeat this process for as long as you want, with the idea being that over a number of repetitions, the recordings lose much of the lower harmonics of the sound, highlighting which partials of the harmonic series are amplified by the room. When you want to stop the piece, you turn off both recording and playback machines. Here's a quick example of what that might sound like in practice. This is a test for I am sitting in a room. This is a test for I am sitting in a room. This is a test for I am sitting in a room. This is a test for I am sitting in a room. This is a test for I am sitting in a room. This is a test for I am sitting in a room. This is a test for I am sitting in a room. This is a test for I am sitting in a room. This is a test for I am sitting in a room. This is a test for I am sitting in a room. Pretty neat, right? I was approached by one of my professors in the final term of my undergraduate degree to quickly make a performable version of this piece for an upcoming concert. I gladly accepted the challenge and was able to successfully code and perform this work. Instead of tape machines, I used the program MaxMSP to make this version. MaxMSP is a widely used and highly versatile piece of software for audio and audiovisual creation. For the purposes of this video, I will only explain the functions I specifically use to create this particular patch and how the patch itself functions. There are hundreds of other functions in Max that you can use to create exciting and unique projects, so there's no way I can possibly cover everything in this tutorial. I will also be making the assumption that you all have a basic general understanding of MaxMSP. If you're interested in learning more, I highly recommend checking out some of the amazing tutorials on YouTube, as well as the extremely helpful built-in Max MSP help guides, as well as the documentation. To this day, I still use the built-in documentation features, as they're incredibly helpful and very user-friendly. From here on out, we'll be looking directly at my patch and explaining how it works. Welcome to my explanation of the patch I made for I Am Sitting in a Room by Elvin Lucier. Uh, as you are looking at now, you can see that this is the performance screen. Uh, it's very different from the patch itself because this is only going to include specific assets that I wanted to show. This is the most important parts for the performance of the piece and for testing and debugging type things. When we go to the actual patching mode, you can see that there's a lot more going on and we're going to try to chunk it. The thing about this piece is that due to the interconnected nature of the two recordings, it's hard to split it into too many small chunks because everything is kind of interconnected. We'll try our best though. To start off with, let's go into lock mode so I can create some things. I'll show you up here is what was used uniquely for my performance with my mentor. We had a recording of Alvin Lucier, and he wanted it to be a sort of dialogue between uh, the performer and Alvin Lucier. 
especially uh, after his passing. This was a very interesting uh, narrative to create where you're kind of speaking with him. So that's why we had this recording of Alvin Lucier speaking as the first iteration, as well as my mentor speaking over it. For the purposes of your own performance, you probably just use the patch from below that point because you're probably going to want to speak it yourself for the first iteration. So the way the patch functions is you hit this button to start it. A trigger bang bang bang. This means that it's going to send out bangs because I've put in bees starting from the right and moving left. So the first thing that happens is it'll go out of this right outlet and do this entire section first before moving on. And that's what we want to have happen. We want this all to go first because this is what happens for the first iteration of the piece. We want the first few recordings to happen pretty much entirely in this end. And then this will be the looping infinite recording section later. Just to set it up though, we need to have this right side. For now, you can ignore all this stuff over here. This is just extra assets used to create uh, the presentation mode, make it look a little nicer. And down here, this is the counting. We'll get to that later, but that's, once again, less important to the actual functioning of the piece and is more aesthetic. So as I was saying, Bang comes out of this outlet and turns on this toggle. This toggle is very important, and that's why it's also in the presentation mode. This is the toggle that you use once you are done recording your first initial recording. But for now, when that turns on, you'll see some things start to happen. This counter starts counting up in milliseconds. It goes to this crop object, and we can see that down here, buffer two is getting some signal. When we turn it off, we can see that now buffer one is getting some signal. There was a bang over here. And this gate has now moved. A lot of things have happened with just that one button press. And you can see we're now in this looping cycle where it's going to now switch between buffer one and buffer two every time it gets to 0 0.058. Now that number will change depending on how long you make your iteration. And right now we're not hearing any audio because I haven't actually set up the audio properly for this patch on purpose because I'm going to be speaking over it. But for now, let's reset the patch, which you can see puts everything back the way it was. This gate is now where it was. There's nothing in the buffers. We've reset everything. We've sent a clear message to the buffer, and the way I like to do this and organize it is that I set up a function with these sends. So S means send, and then R means receive. So it receives my new function reset, which all over the patch will reset the different things needed to restart the patch from zero. This is especially helpful for when you're practicing so that you don't end up having to completely shut down and restart the patch every time you want to try another take. And it's also especially helpful if something goes horribly wrong. Uh, but what happens when this turns on is it starts this counter, which counts up in milliseconds. Let's see that happen again. Yes. And over here, it hasn't banged yet. So this gate hasn't moved. And what this is doing is helping us to use the buffer object better. So buffers are interesting because they record audio into a specific location. If you don't set the size of a buffer, it will be zero, meaning that you can't actually record anything into it. It won't work properly. So you need to set the size before you do anything. Because we don't know exactly how long our recording is going to be, and we don't want to have dead air at the end of it, what we do is we set an initial size of the recording that we know will be bigger than our first recording. And then we crop it afterwards, which is what this function is going to do once that gate opens. At the same time, we're also counting so that we know how long each iteration is going to be so that we can send it to this delay, which helps the loop start. For now, let's turn that off and just hit reset. And we can see that everything is back the way it was again. When you hit this uh, button up here, what it does is it sends a zero to this, which sends a bang out, 
which triggers the crop and also switches the gate. Switches the gate first so that the crop actually gets through and gets sent to the delay as well as the buffers to create the size of the buffers. Once it enters this system over here, we can see that this is what's playing each recording. It goes down to this volume meter, which everything is connected to, including the recording we used for the initial one in my performance. And it goes down to the volume to have it actually output. When it goes through each of these systems, they can be chunked separately so that you have one is playing buffer one and recording buffer two. The other one is playing buffer two and recording buffer one. By checking this outlet, we can see that it bangs when playback reaches the destination, which means when the recording reaches the end point, it sends out a bang to this, which we put into the other cycle. So it constantly switches back and forth based on the length of the buffers, which is what we set over here with the crop. And it will just go back and forth and back and forth until we click this toggle up here, which turns off the next playback. So what we do effectively there is we say, after you're done playing back this one, stop the cycle, stop the systems. And it lets us have a clean, clear ending that doesn't just suddenly happen at any point during the recording, it happens after a playback, which is what we want. So over here, let's look back at the performance to finish off. The performance patch we have here, set time higher than expected length of loop. So you're gonna wanna set this higher in seconds uh, than you know that your first recording will be. To start it, you hit the blank button and you can see that it's recording into there. You stop it and it's recording into there. Now it's going to switch back and forth and is now playing loop one and recording loop three. You set your volume over here. Uh, if you need to suddenly stop it, say it's uh, feedback looping onto itself, you've put the speakers too close to the microphone, kill just stops the audio right away and reset resets the entire patch. I hope this was helpful and that you can use this own patch as inspiration for your own performances of this incredible work. I am sitting in a room, different from the one you are in now. I am recording the sound of my speaking voice, and I am going to play it back into the room again and again until the resonant frequencies of the room reinforce themselves so that any semblance of my speech, with perhaps the exception of rhythm, is destroyed. What you will hear then are the natural resonant frequencies of the room articulated by speech. I am sitting in a room, different from the one you are in now. I am recording the sound of my speaking voice and I am going to play it back into the room again and again until the resonant frequencies of the room reinforce themselves so that any semblance of my speech, with perhaps the exception of rhythm, is destroyed. What you will hear then are the natural resonant frequencies of the room articulated by speech. I am sitting in a room different from the one you are in now. I am recording the sound of my speaking voice, and I am going to play it back into the room again and again until the resonant frequencies of the room reinforce themselves so that any semblance of my speech, with perhaps the exception of rhythm, is destroyed. What you will hear then are the natural resonant frequencies of the room articulated by speech. I am sitting in a room different from the one you are in now. I am recording the sound of my speaking voice, and I am going to play it back into the room again and again until the resonant frequencies of the room reinforce themselves so that any semblance of my speech, with perhaps the exception of rhythm, is destroyed. What you will hear then are the natural resonant
To conclude, I wanted to give a few more pieces of advice about the performance of this piece. Your choice of equipment will greatly affect the timbre of your recordings. Depending on which microphone and speakers you choose, and your positioning of them in a given space, you'll get drastically different sounds. Use this to your advantage and experiment with different gear until you find the sound you're looking for. Lastly, don't stress about extraneous noises, mouth sounds, or other often unwanted sonic material. For the purposes of this piece, you can allow all the sounds you generally try to avoid in recording to seep into your performance. It often creates a stronger connection between the listener and the piece when they can tell that you're recording live and there's no chance you pre-recorded this entire performance. If you're interested in learning more about Alvin Lucier, I've included some links in the description in addition to all the image and music credits. Thanks for watching. 